Well, we're doing this again. But something seems a bit different. Hmm, I wonder why. You know, I think it's because we're recording in July. That's gotta be it. Yeah, so hello, I am Megapig9001, and this is my third interview with Miko Tan, the head organizer of Toho Fest. Hi. So. Nice to meet you in person finally again. Yeah. We actually tried doing this like before, but just circumstances wouldn't work out. So yeah, it it's been a month long process, months long, and yeah, finally glad to do this. So for the third time, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, so I'm Miko Tan. I'm the chair of Toho Fest, and uh, um, we obviously had a um, really amazing uh, first event. So, like, I'm really glad to be now sitting in front of you now for the third no for the third time now live, which is a very different experience, perhaps. So rather than just you know talking across on Discord, so. Yeah, it's definitely you know, nice just to be able to do this in person. So I'm glad to uh, be here, and I'm looking forward to next year, of course. Yeah. So relating to Toho Fest, yeah, the event happened, and of any convention I've seen, this has had one of the most positive responses just, like, in person, out of person, I've ever seen for any event. So I wanted to know what it felt like when you saw, like, all of these positive responses flow in, like, during and after the event. I mean, this whole experience, you know, even now, it feels very surreal. Even sitting together like this, like, I never thought I'd be interviewed like like this before. And, um, like, I've been going to conventions since, like, you know, AX 2009. So, yeah, I'm pretty old. And to see all these responses, and, you know, when, when you go to conventions, you're used to the phrase, you know, oh, you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And, um... But like you know, this whole thing has been like incredibly overwhelming, and like it's been, uh, I think it's just been an overall just absolutely amazing experience. You know, like I'm pretty sure like everyone is just super happy. You know, all the guests I've heard are super happy, all the attendees are super happy, all the vendors are super happy. So I'm like, like I don't know where do we go from here at this point. I'm just really just again, it just feels very surreal and just like overwhelming at the same time. It's just whole mix of feelings and such, you know. So it's it's really hard to describe, especially like when you're in the moment and it's like okay, you know, I'm trying to take it all in, and then I still gotta you know okay, we gotta finish this thing here, and then there's the, you know the next act or okay, you know we finished closing ceremonies, okay, we gotta finish tearing down. So there's just so much stuff going on all at once, you know, and just because the convention's over for you guys like hey you know i still gotta make sure okay we got you know get everything cleaned up you know got everything packed you know i gotta get the guests you know back to the you know um to the airport so there's all this stuff going on so you're just like it just doesn't stop so an ongoing process pretty much yeah and then it's like as soon as this one ends we announce 2024 and it's like shoot we gotta start prepping for the next one already so it's just that there's not necessarily no. It does. It, it doesn't necessarily stop at that point. Yeah. So kind of relating to this frenzy, as you were telling me a bit in private, a lot of stuff from the event happened towards the like the tail end of right before. So certain things like certain guests showing up, and then like the amount of ticket sales that happened in like the two weeks before the event. So can you talk a bit about some of those things? Yeah, so essentially going into um, going into the first event, my biggest concern at that point, like getting to day zero, was we would not have enough staff. We were going to be short staffed, and it's like because um, because we knew that that um, ticket sales always shoot up towards like the last week. We just didn't know by how much it was going to shoot up. Um, and that made it difficult because when you order and print the badges, you have to do that about two weeks in advance. So it was really hard for us to estimate that. And then again, because it's the first year, you know, we do have to be kind of conservative with our estimates. Uh, and we only printed 700 attendee badges. And it turns out we ended up running out, which was hilarious. Um, and it turns out like, yeah, it just, there's all these different things because like for all of us, it's the first time. So we just didn't know a lot of the nuances. We didn't know, like, let's say, you know, should we put everybody in one line? Should we, you know, how how else to, or should we start dividing up the lines? We just didn't know. So 
it was well we just kind of a lot of times we just kind of okay we had an idea and we just you know figured it out and run, ran things on the fly at this point so but um i mean things i think still worked out so and we now know going into next year um okay yeah we need we we definitely going to need more staff we're definitely going to have to you know, divide up the lines so we know what not to do for next year i came a bit early so i didn't actually get to see it but did you like see the the line for the people who came to register day one? Because I heard it was very intense. I saw the videos and I walked outside and it's like you see it like that and it wraps and wraps around the building like oh, that's a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, for to give perspective to people who weren't there, I have a friend who lives ten minutes away from the venue. He got there fairly early. I think he still had to wait an hour in line. Yeah, and what happened was we were trying to get like the Wi-Fi set up because the Wi-Fi was a bit weird. But once we kind of figured that out, then it's like okay, started speeding up the process a little bit. And then the problem was we didn't we put all both pre-reg and Akon in the same line and realized we can't do that anymore. So we have to like split up the line you no know, mm. for next time. So stuff like just to kind of divide up the traffic a little bit. So because wrapping around in a parking lot like that, even though it's not like a heavily used, it's still better not to do that. Yeah, it was kind of like a cool. It, it was, it's a bit weird. It's kind of a mix of both, because on one hand, yeah, you had those organizational issues, but on the other hand, kind of demonstrates, like, how big the event was, like, tangibly, mm -hmm. just at the very offset. Yeah, so, and it's like, again, none of, a, none of us knew how big it was going to be. We knew we were going to get at least 500, 600 people. We didn't know what the high number was going to be, though. So, again, it's more like all this stuff going on, and it's like, you know try and take it all in and then realize, okay, that's overwhelming. And then like, okay, let's try manage it. Let's, you know, let's try and clear the queue and such. So like, again, there's like all this stuff going on. So you have to understand it's like, um, like you feel the shock and it's like, uh, okay, let's, um, let's try and clear this out. Okay. It's like that. But no, by, by around 12 o'clock, one o'clock, you know, we were able to clear the queue and things, you know, what was rolling pretty smoothly actually. Yeah. So that's good to know that it sounds like a lot of the line issues will be sorted out for next year's event, hopefully. Correct, yes. Okay. So, yeah. It is cool. So, yeah. So I guess we talked about a bit of this before, but, like, yeah, running an event like Toho Fest, yeah, takes a lot of work. Really stressful. So I want to know, like, you personally, what did you think the hardest parts of running the event were? The first year? So... As we meant, as I mentioned before, so we planned this since spring of 2021. So we got like a planning committee together, and we started discussing, you know, how do you know, how is this event going to look like? Where the venue is going to be? Who do we want to have on the course staff? How many people do we need on staff? How many guests do we want to get? Which guests do we want to get? So the biggest part about it is that because there were just a lot of unknown factors at that point. Like, obviously, at the time when we were planning, you know, the COVID pandemic is still raging. So, and there was a lot of just uncertainty going on, just in general. There's also, like, the past issues, and you no, know, uh, there are also past issues. There's also just a lot of skepticism in general, um, just because of, like, well, you know, this is, like, a first year, and then they say, oh, it's held in Los Angeles, that's a bit too far from me. So there's all these different things that we just, that it's really difficult for us to control, and the only thing that we can do is truly just to be able to mitigate that and to say, okay, well, if you are traveling that far, you know, we want to pick a venue that is closer to LAX, closer to an inter inter international airport. At least that will help mitigate, like, the travel and such. And then, like, okay, well, we want to pick, you know, hotels where that were going to be a little bit cheaper, a little more affordable, again, that would help mitigate it. But, you know, if you aren't able to physically show up because it's too far for them or, you know, because, like, you know, people didn't know what their financial situations were, you know, that's really hard for us to, to control. So we can only control what we can. Okay. So a lot of these issues come down to, like, trying to cater to as many people as possible, it sounds like. Kind of, yeah. So because it's like when you look, as you very well know, the Toho community is both kind of niche but also kind of broad at the same time. So we ran into stuff like logistics and, you know, um, we ran into issues of like um, what can we feasibly do given like the fact that, you know, our resources and our time is pretty limited. None of us do this full time, obviously. 
and um, trying to create an event that at least would at least satisfy you know different groups of people and such within the Toho community. But obviously, we cannot satisfy, we cannot please everyone. So, but we can at least you know give a, like a little bit of everything, but just not just not everything that everyone wants. That is how it is. So, and it's also managing kind of like expectations and such, too. Like we're not like. Obviously, we're not Ray Tai Sai. You know, we don't have that kind of budget. We don't have that kind of experience. So, all the kind of managing experience, managing okay, um, like you know, this is what people can re- can feasibly expect for the first year and such. So that's really like there's like all lo- there's just a number of factors, not just balancing costs, logistics, expectations, you know, so many different things and such, but. After you get past all that for the first year, it's like okay, now you have a baseline. Now you know, you know, now you can kind yeah, of zone in. What's and going on? Exactly. Yeah. So relating to like, yeah, all of the, all of the shenanigans of the first event. So one of these perceived like, everyone thought this might have ended in a disaster. It actually ended up becoming a highlight of the event was the Tom Music concert. So it's like, I think people have heard scattered stories from different people talking about it, but there's never been one collected place where someone's just talked about exactly what happened and, like, why that moment was so magical. Mm -hmm. So can you recap the Tom Music concert for people who might have missed it? Okay, cool. So, um, so to kind of recap a little bit, so Tom Music, he, um, a few months before the event, he actually reached out to us on his personal Twitter, not his through his staff Twitter, he, threw, he actually reached out to Tofest on his personal Twitter to say, hey, you know, he was planning, he knew about us, he knew about Tofest. He said, hey, you know, I'm going to be traveling to L.A. actually in April. So he was actually going to be in the area. And he said, well, he was going to be, you know, traveling around and uh, basically before Ray Tai Sai. So he said, hey, he introduce himself. I mean, does he need an induction to us? Not really. Um... Can I perform at your event? I'm like, um, like this is unexpected. So, um, we quickly spoke to our team, you know, see, okay, where can we fit him in? Because we want to accommodate, like, you know, to have a big guest come out, like, in Japan and come out, you know, and come to you. That's not an opportunity that comes by, like, often. So, and we were able to adjust, you know, like, the schedule. And, um, yeah, like, you know, um, give him a booth and everything, like, you know, Okay, here's what I need. Okay, cool. We'll we take care of that for you, uh, for Tom. And um, so, okay. And the idea was that we had the Odyssey concert on Saturday. That was meant to be like the big, you know, you know, end with a bang thing Saturday evening. For Sunday, um, so we actually had Tam perform on the outdoor stage. We had two stages. Okay. And... Uh, I know we didn't probably do as much sound check as like that because all his files were like that. So we had some issues with the sound, as you probably remember. Mm-hmm. Okay, but he kept on going through and um, he played like a few songs and then there were some sound issues going on. And then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, he's like doing his best and like he just kind of rolls with the punches, I guess, because he's, you know, there's a reason why when I introduce him, he's called, I call him the master violinist. Um... And then he started like taking requests and started performing like some songs. And then the magical thing that really happened is that he noticed, you know, um, there were other uh, people in the audience, you know, that brought their own that brought their own instruments. Makes sense. A lot of people love Toho music. So there's one guy he came and he had a flute and he saw him like that, like, hey, do you want to come up and play? And it's like, oh, okay. And then the audience went like that. And then you know there is you no know, your, your friend Marty. No, she's cosplaying Maribel at the time. It's like, okay, she had like her stand, like, okay, so then she gets invited up, and then more and more people, and all of a sudden, it's like he had an impromptu like ensemble going, which I can tell you in like the many years I've gone to like concerts and such, that's an absolutely just crazy thing because I've never seen that happen. And you know, sound issues aside, it's like that was one of the most magical moments that ever happened. So imagine, you know, you watching a TAM concert, watching a professional concert. Okay, cool. You know, that's very enjoyable. And it turns out you don't even have to be a Toho fan to enjoy the music, obviously. Mm-hmm. But then how, but then it's more like how cool it would be to have, have the guest or the performer play with the audience. That's just like mind blowing to me. And then I know Mary, she, Maribel, she, um, um, 
And like to her, it's like it feels surreal because it's like she mentioned like, oh, you know, Tom is her idol, is her idol, and you know, she always loved to be able to you know to watch him play. And then all of a sudden, he invites her up. Now you get to play with your idol. So it was just, so it was just absolutely just you know, it was just absolutely crazy, you know. So it's like it's just. It's a really hard to describe feeling of excitement and just like overall like the kind of we call like I guess the Dojin like self made is like this is like an impromptu. And don't forget that was purely off the cuff. We did not know um, he was going to do that because we said like okay his set was going to be an hour and a half, and he did like for the first forty five minutes. I didn't expect him to do that. So it was like okay, we just roll with it. All right, like wow. So and after the concert, he said okay, we're going to do his signings. And he had a booth, you know, next to the stage, and then the line literally wrapped around almost the, the entire way around the plaza. It was like... And, and keep in mind, after Tam, he, what he does is he, I think he traveled to... After our event, he traveled out to Las Vegas. Yeah. Hanging mm. out there, hanging out, and then flew Friday, before, the Friday, flew back to Japan, restocked all his stuff, and stood the Ray Tysa. He did Ray Tysa and Toe Fest back to back. I don't know how that guy did, does that. Anyways, but that's that, that, all that in a nutshell. Yeah, I think that thing you said about it capturing the Dojin spirit like sums up perfectly. Like, my friend Mary, I can talk a bit about this. Yeah, that was kind of like something they were actually telling me. Like, you know, it'd be kind of cool if I were able to like meet Tam and play violin for him, and then being able to play on stage with it was, him. Yeah, one of the highlights of their life. It's pretty crazy so i know it still yeah. like boggles my mind to this day too so anyways yeah so yeah i think for many people that concert was probably the best part of toho fest but there are plenty of other crazy things that happened during the event so i wanted to know from the head organizer what were some of your favorite things that happened during toho fest oh that's uh that's tough for me because it's like Cause there's a lot of really just good moments like obviously you know um like the odyssey concert was absolutely amazing um unfortunately i didn't get to see a lot of the cosplay uh, gatherings i was only able to attend one myself um sorry to say i did not see the gaming hall very much and i didn't see any of the tournaments i barely walked inside there like three or four times um i think really you know just like the overall just seeing you know all these like little people you know from like all over the place, you know, relatively well-known people within the community, just interacting and just having fun with everyone. Um, and uh, the reason why I say the Odyssey concert, like, because um, that was when, like, you know, it starts off a bit slow because I've never seen like that. And then it starts picking up, you know, more and more energy, more and more speed, sort of like how you're you know, shifting gears. You start first, mm. second, and just keeps on going upward. Like, oh, That's okay. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah. And then it's like, uh, you know, so I can talk about this after the fact. So when I spoke with uh, Odyssey, uh, I said, okay, you're going to do like an hour and a half. She said, that's fine. You know, because it's, of course, a total event, you know, we want to have at least 50%. That's a general rule that we have. Now, how she arranges her set, how re whatever song she picks, is purely up to her. And my only snippet was, well, because she's closing out the evening, go out with a bang. I didn't know what it was going to be. And so, and she plays like Savior of the Sky, and she plays it, you know, with the correct, you know, and she performs both verses. It was like, wow, that's just, you know. It was like never before heard, right? Correct, because the way how it's recorded is that I think there was, I think when she recorded it, she recorded the first verse, and I think there was something wrong or, or audio-wise, and I guess she was trying to get it out in time. So she just simply reused, like, the first verse. So she's never, and don't forget, she's never, I don't think she's performed the Toho songs all that often. So that was literally the very first time that, you know, that's how that song is actually meant to be sound, with the correct, with the correct two verses and such, which is, again, kind of insane. And... Something else towards and like really magical, you know, happens where it's like again she invites the audience and everyone's like really like that's like I'm now like more like a full on rock style like a rock concert and during that moment, um, the uh, somebody pointed out and I checked you know Twitter and holy crap the hashtag yeah, Toho Fest was trending on I've seen Toho Project trending I didn't expect hashtag Toho Fest to be trending on Twitter it was like. 
what? And then probably the best moment is that, you know, we decided because we planned this out, we want it for closing ceremonies. We said, okay, if we're going to end with one song, we have to end with Bad Apple. And then you have the entire audience there chanting Toho Fest. It's like, again, I've seen them chant like, you know, in, in, you know the, the guest's name. I've never seen, I've, again, I've been to so many conventions. I've never seen an audience chant the event's name like that. And I'm the one standing on the stage. I was like, like, this is a dream. This is not a dream. Like, this is happening? What? Maybe like, it's, it's a dream. Maybe nothing else is real. <laughs> nothing else is real, yep. But it's, uh, but yeah, it's really that, that, that feeling. It's like, you know, but just again, overall, just seeing everyone come together and it's like to show like, hey, you know, we can have a convention centered around Toe and it can be incredibly fun and enjoyable for everyone. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, cringe as some people thought it was going to be. It doesn't have to, you know, people, it, it didn't end in failure as so many people thought it was going to be. Like, no, it can actually be done right, but it has to be done right. So, yeah. So kind of related to your stage experience, I feel like in the lead up and the aftermath to Toho Fest, you've become a lot more prominent of a face in the Toho community. So I was kind of curious, because I sort of have a reputation myself too, like, what's it been like growing in the Toho community, and then like, what new like responsibilities or like problems do you kind of face with that sort of stigma? Yeah. I mean, it's more like, again, it's just kind of the, again, the kind of a very surreal kind of odd feeling because to me is at the end of the day, like I'm still, like I still consider myself a Toho fan, you know, and a cosplayer, that's fine. And um, like, I didn't expect people like I, I go to Anime Expo and I see like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, people, they know, they know who I am. They'd call me like, hey, you know, Miku Tan, like, you know, what's up? And at AX, I had one of my, you know, one of my friends. He didn't get a chance to, but he actually brought his Toe Fest badge. He asked me to actually sign his badge. Like, what? Okay. And um, when I was, you know, there at AX at the gathering, you know, I knew like half the faces I knew you. You know, I knew like half the half the cosplayers went to Toe Fest, and everyone was enjoying themselves. And like, even when I go on to like other discords or even streams, people knew knew who I was. I was like, what? But. <clears throat> Like, you know, but to quote, you know, uh, you know, but to quote Spider-Man, you know, it's, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, too. So I always have to be a bit mindful that I'm not just another fan mm -hmm. anymore. You know, I do have to be careful with what I say. I do have to be a little bit mindful, like, you know, to be neutral and um, to show, like, you know, I'm that I still have to be mindful of, you know, the kind of influence that I, that I have at that point. So... Um, and the fact that not everyone is always going to, you know, agree with yeah. me, not everyone's always going to, to like what we're doing and such, and, you know, it's fine, but it's just something that, like, you know, I am trying to deal with, so it is what it is, so, um, there's always two sides of that, so, but generally speaking, it's been fairly positive and such, so, because I don't want to make myself, like, oh, you know, just because I'm the head person, you know, I don't want it to seem like I'm unreachable or whatever. Like, I want to show, like, yes, I do hold that position, but at the same time, I'm still a fan, you know. It's not like I don't talk to people and stuff. I don't interact with people. So, like I said, it's just something that I'm slowly kind of working my way through and such. So, Yeah, quite an interesting experience to grow in. I have made mistakes along the way, but, yeah, just growing to learn about, yeah, your social responsibility... And also, yeah, still trying to be a fan at the same time. It's a very delicate balance because of trying to see, you know, w where does the fan stop or anything, and where does I have to put on the hat of like, okay, I'm the chair and such, and it's like, okay, it's just that, it, no, it's not a very clear line, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, something a lot of people are curious about. So. For example, I think I saw someone from the Toho staff tweet, like, they played a game of Hanafuda with Tam, like, in the staff back room, which looked like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are kind of curious, like, what was the experience, like, working with the guests? <clears throat> I mean, so, like, um, it's really, it's honestly speaking really fun. Um, so, um, obviously each guest is going to be different, so, but, like... You, you you always have to remember that you know they're also fans too and they also want to be you know treated like their people as well but at the same time you know you also have to be respectful to them like 
with Pun, um, for example, uh, she, you know, there's a lot of people, like, you know, might say, she's actually quite shy, and she doesn't like being on stage very much. So we do have to try to accommodate for that. Um, with, um, uh, with Lyrica Live, um, again, we're, she wanted to do like a, she wanted to do like a karaoke style panel and such. Okay. So we're trying to cater for that. Um, for again, Tokyo Radio, they had their booth and we had to figure out like their sound issues for Odyssey, you know, she has to figure out, we had to figure out, okay, um, what her sound setup is going to be and with Tam, it's like, and at first, you know, um, you know, in, you know, this that definitely does happen is that even a lot of our staff and you know were a little bit intimidated a little bit you know starstruck because it's like you know i don't mind mentioning this so meadow kitty you know she's been a huge fan of odyssey for like you know around a decade so seeing her just right there it's like like hey you know she's standing right there would you like me to introduce you and it's like oh okay so i mean Trust me, like now that I'm older and stuff, I'm a little more experienced. You know, if I was ten years younger, yeah, I might have <laughs> have felt the same way. But like now, it's like I don't feel that anymore. I don't feel that kind of intimidation. I don't feel that level of starstruck anymore. So I'm definitely more, I'm a little more comfortable in doing that. And also just sitting at the end, like we had like the staff dinner, we had the guests there, and at a certain point, people were just talking, just having you know like that. You know that kind of starstruckness kind of just goes away. And they're just people, and there's you know is a bunch of people getting together and just sitting down and, you know, after an event and then just enjoying themselves. That's it, you know? Yeah. Sounds like a great experience. And it sounds like a lot of that also comes down to what we were saying before. Every Toho fan is different, and that includes the guests. So hearing how you're able to cater to all of them sounds really nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is. So, like, you know, even despite, like, the like the language barrier and such, you know, Tam, he was, you know, freaking enjoying, you know, enjoying himself like crazy. So, um, like, I don't, again, I don't know how that guy has just so much crazy energy and such. But like I said, he's also a very seasoned guy. He's been acting, like, what, since, like, 2006, I think? So he just rose with it and such. It's like, yeah, like, I've done Call Me Cat. I've done Ray Tice. It's like, pfft, like, Toe Fist, you know. It still looks like that, but, like, this is still enjoyable. It's different. So, but, yeah, you know, um, but the thing that, like I said, you do have to be respectful to them. You don't want to be, like, fanning over them and such. So... So there's a fine line that you have to watch out for and such. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a bit related to Tam, and I think you've told me about this, but not many other people, but like, so there are several advantages that Toho Fest has because it's run in California, and because of that, it seems like it's going to stay there for a bit of the foreseeable future. So I kind of just wanted to ask you to explain why running Toho Fest in California like offers some advantages compared to possible other places right so um well one you know just from a, um so just from a legal perspective the main organization is based here in california it's based in los angeles so legally speaking we're only allowed to do business in california so that's literally the first one the second one is the most of the core team is also based here in los angeles like joey's based in los angeles i'm based in los angeles I mean, all of our supplies are all, you know, are all here and such. That's number that's number two. Number three is if we do, we are, of course, looking to get um, more guests from Japan. Flying them from J from Tokyo to Los Angeles is going to be much cheaper than flying them from Tokyo to Los Angeles and Los Angeles to, like, let's say, Chicago, for example. So there's also costs stuff like that. Plus, um, a lot of the big game companies like Exceed is actually local to, to the Torrance area. So there's several advantages of like that. And also we chose springtime and such like the weather. I think a lot of people you know thought like, you know, it's going to be too warm. Actually, it was a bit cold. Actually, we got a little bit lucky. So the weather generally speaking in L you know, L L.A. is generally speaking, you know, quite, you know, quite nice, actually. So um, there's you no know, there's that advantage and such. Uh, and like I said, you know, you'll be because, you know, the West Coast historically has had a pretty high Asian slash Japanese population, we were able to find that venue, which I think everyone was like, they really, really enjoyed. If this was, if Tofest was held in a hotel or a convention center, it would still feel somewhat generic. Yeah. And it's going to be, you're going to be, I feel like it's going to be pretty hard pressed to find a venue of that kind of similarity, all those amenities in like, let's say, you know, in another part of the country, I feel. Yeah. So there's, those are the advantages of like that. I know a lot of people, you know, who is probably going to be seeing this is not going to agree with that. But, you know, like I said, it is what it is at this point. 
Yeah, just a quick aside about the weather. So for people like me and Miko Tan, it was kind of freezing towards the end. I mean, all the people flying out of California are like, what are you talking about? This is, like, so warm. Because for us, 60 degrees, it might as well be snowing. Yeah, we're spoiled by the weather here. We're very much so. We had a very mild, mild spring and summer, if you think about it. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's... um. um like for people like Pun, because she's from Canada, like this is like warm for her. So, and for people like Kayla, who or Lala, who's from Arizona, she's used to like you know, like I hope she's doing well. She's used yeah. to doing like very hot weather. It's like, oh, this is cold. I have to put on my jackets over my cosplay. It's like, what? Okay, <laughs> okay, it is what it is. All right, we're just gonna roll with it. Anyways. All right, bit of a silly question about cosplay, but coincidentally, you are the Miko guy. I think I had statistics someone gave me about cosplays they personally saw. Mm -hmm. I think there were only three total cosplays from UFO. How did that happen? Well, do I answer this in, as in character as Miko, or do I like that? Anyways, so um, so what happened was, I know uh, Joey was cosplaying New Way, I yeah. believe, on Sunday. Um, Medikitty, she was supposed to cosplay Murasa on Sunday morning, but then I think you know she wasn't feeling that well, so she didn't have time. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna put on Cherno. So there was that, and uh, I think I saw there was there might have been a Kokasa cosplayer. I think I don't remember. Um, uh, technically, I know there was a uh, Cloudy. There's a couple of Mammy Zows. So I think that's from. That's not that. She's that not, that's Ten Desires, yeah. Yeah, that's not really. That's not like that. Um, trying to think was there um i don't think there was kyoko but yeah there was no one from the buddhist faction and i pointed that out in the crowd so um um i could have had something to do with it i could have not so i'm not going to comment on that one no confirm or deny okay nope. <laughs> well i think that was a very nice overview of kind of yeah this past OFest. Mm -hmm. so now i want to look a bit to the future of course this is still very in flux so can't talk about much i still think there are some interesting points to reach on so a bit indirectly, so last interview we talked about how the Toho Fest Discord was kind of growing to become a part of the community. Mm -hmm. I think since Toho Fest, it's actually become even bigger to the point where now I would even argue it is one of the like biggest Western Toho communities. And before you were talking about like the balance of things like adding emotes and stuff to like running the event, but now we actually do have more emotes in the server. And then you have things like Discord events, like you have people playing games like essentially daily on voice chat and streaming and then yeah. me personally i do a lot of the karaoke nights and i've had a ton of fun exactly so like i kind of wanted to ask like now what's running the server like post ofs because this is kind of like i'd say the main driving force for people to come back well the funny thing is i can i could check right now um let's see what's going on here like that so crazy crazily enough i'm checking the server right now i mean it's interesting because um see what else is going on here we are at we are at 996 members now we're on we're four away from a full 1000 that's and we are planning on doing a giveaway actually a giveaway interesting yeah i'm not gonna tell you what the giveaway is but um you know but it is what it like that so it's interesting because it's like it's almost like two separate no things because it's like what no it's almost as if the total fest server is like oh my gosh it's almost as if we are a virtual event would have thought i mean but it is difficult because our main focus has always been on the main event itself the physical event and you no know, um but now having the discord is now it's like you kind of have to build separate teams just for that so that's something that we're trying to manage and such so once we start expanding the staff we can hopefully put more resources towards like the discord and such um we honestly didn't expect it was going to become like that active and that robust like uh okay we're gonna have to um, um we're gonna have to put more resources into that so, yeah i remember uh, like i think back when i bought my ticket it was kind of just uh oh here's a cool thing for people who pre-registered and that's kind of like what it felt like it was going to be but yeah it's just crazy to see how things have changed since then yeah pretty much yeah like there's a whole community built around all this and people like sharing stuff like that sharing cosplays and then just you know like i think it was when they found out hey i've actually physically met all these people at the event they're all so cool i want to continue you know to build those relationships like okay well so rather than just being like you know um just anonymous hashtag on the discord and you no know, like that you see that like, no this person's kind of cool but you never met the guy before you never met the person before i should say 
I can actually talk a bit about this. So I met a friend, their name is Slaglord on the ToeFest Discord. Mm -hmm. He lives in <laughs> My family was coincidentally going on vacation in <laughs> Even though I never met him in person at Toho Fest, I actually got to meet up with him, like, in when we were on vacation. So it's like, that would not have happened without the Toho Fest Discord. Mmm, yeah. Now, I met him at, I believe, during, um... I so saw he had, like, you know, an Al's Fumo was commenting about that, like, hey, you know, and then I have a conversation with him and I told him about Toho Fest. And then, lo and behold, he comes by and he said, this, he said, this was, like, the most fun experience I've ever had, you know, so... But yeah, it is, um... But because you start meeting these people and start like, oh, there's actually a face behind the mm -hmm. name and such, right? There's a face behind Delta Pi. There's a face behind Mega Pig. There's a face behind, you know, uh, Mari, like all these different names and stuff like that. And it turns out everyone's pretty chill and such. So that's really cool. Anyways. Yeah. So, yeah. Multiple people will ask this across multiple platforms. So I guess to sum it up. So for next year's Toho Fest, so like... What's the biggest thing you want to improve, or like what new things do you want to try to implement? Well, first thing, everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the long, the, that's the short answer. The long answer is, well, you know, we definitely want to improve security and staffing. Uh, we definitely want to, you know, smooth out our operational and our, and our organizational issues, like I said, with the lines, you know, with the registration. But definitely, like, you know, we have to start expanding. Like, you know, the artist alley, there's like, wow, there's so much demand. We got to expand the artist alley. We want to be able to utilize more space because. Now we're, you know, we're definitely going to be getting more people. We're estimating maybe anywhere from 1,200 to 1,400 people. So that's an over 50 to 60% increase. So we're definitely going to have to need more space. But again, you know, we still want to be kind of conservative because we don't want to like, you know, expand too quickly at the same time. And so again, you have this kind of balancing act still, right? So um, it's not like all of a sudden we can just simply double our budget, you know, out of the blue and such so we'll see how that goes because uh we definitely want to you know build up our experience and build up you know our, our resources to uh you know try and get like you know of course we got to go for like the big guy right mm -hmm. so because that's always you know the one thing that everyone's going to want so we're going to build up try and build up to that um but you know obviously you know getting you know you know uh more important you no know, uh, getting bigger guests um uh, perhaps getting we're in talks to try and get like Amiyami, J-List, uh, we're in talks to try and get, you know, even Total Lost Word even. So we'll see how that goes and stuff. We'll try and reach out to all those people. Um, so there's also all that. So that's what we're all looking forward to and such. Um, but we'll see. But like I said, we, we got to do it slowly, obviously. Got it. Okay. So I've got a bit of an exclusive here. And I've gotten permission to talk about this, so you don't have to worry about spoiling the details. Go ahead. But a friend of mine named SciShow, he has a plan to run an Izakaya cart at Toho Fest 2024. And me personally, I think this would end up being one of the coolest new additions to Toho Fest. Just one of the coolest things to see at a convention in general. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the details of it. And again, we have total permission to talk about this. Yeah, so this one, uh, I don't necessarily mind. Um, it's still like in the works and such. So as to what the actual thing is going to look like, I, I don't I still don't know either so yes um, one thing that we are working on as, as part of the expansion is like hey you know uh, one of the games out there the fan games is Miss DSD Zakaya it's like okay um, so you know, obviously people they just want, as more people comes in people are gonna want more food so okay so the concept is to do like one of those food vendor stands like okay and to have like some rather simple foods and drinks and to have like a um, um have like maybe like an outdoor seating and you know we know one of the people that was one of the performers her name is uh giselle or kitty temtem she's actually the head uh she runs um she's the head organizer of uh, made academy cafe so hmm because at first when scishow pushed pitched the idea i thought it was just going to be like you know just a food vendor but then he said i wanted to be that an actual kind of like a sit down place well, I do know people who has the servers and the thing who could help do that. So, you know, I'm like in my mind, I'm trying mm -hmm. to, I see the different pieces and I'm trying to put it all together and such. So the concept would be to have like a little area kind of, you know, roped off. Say, okay, hey, you know, you come in to get your food here, you can place your orders. And then um, that'll be Sideshow and his group. And then it will be Giselle and her group actually serving the food and stuff like that. And like whether or not, you know, is it going to be like an actual food cart or is it going to bring out a grill and everything? Are they going to do like, 
restaurant or they're going to do like sitting sit down times that's all up in the air i ha i actually have no idea like i'm only peripherally involved in that because again i have no idea how to run a restaurant or anything like that so uh but that is definitely really cool to see you know so like i said it's uh and i think you know and you know who doesn't want you know to have access to more food right so yeah like it's always in restaurant i don't think that ever happened in this country probably right as far as I'm aware of, no. So that'll be like the first of its kind, essentially. You know, if they can pull together and like, we can, you know, create that, then all the more power to them, you know? So um, I'll do what I can, obviously, to mm -hmm. make sure that becomes successful. So for a prospective uh, Toho Fest 2024 attendees, hopefully you can look forward to that. I'm really excited to see where the project goes. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. Those are about all the questions I had for Toho Fest, but yeah, you actually have an event coming up soon, which I believe is called, yeah, SoCal Idol Fest. Correct, yeah. So. Uh, see, I don't have my, I didn't bring, my, bring, bring my flyers with me. So yeah, so SoCal Idol Fest will be happening on August 12th um, at the same location, Torrance a Cultural Arts Center. Um, I'm actually the co-chair of that one as well. And the concept behind this is going to be a one-day event instead of a two-day like Toho Fest, and it's going to be more uh, of a music festival style thing. So if you saw Toho Fest with the outdoor stage, it's going to be just the outdoor stage, nine hours but thirteen performances. And you can go on to scidolfest.com. Uh, they've already announced all the um, um all the guests, all the performances, and they've already have the schedule all lined up. So. Um, yeah, that's definitely really cool to be able to see that and such. Um, like, we definitely want to utilize that venue a bit more. So, because everyone seems to really like the venue. And it's like, be I think also just the fact that it's outdoors, everyone feels a little bit more relaxed, it seems like, you know. Um, just because I think if you try and pack too many people indoors, people still feel a little bit, on you know, a little bit, you know, wary, a little bit unsafe still. So, that's that one. But, like, yeah, that's definitely something I'm looking forward to as well. Um... And then technically we've got one more in December, on December 2nd in Little Tokyo, we've got uh, the Andy Marketplace event, which is the main flagship event of the organization. So definitely looking out for that too. Right. So yeah, Californians, we want some events to attend. There you go. <laughs> yep. So yeah, we got like free events, you know, and then we got perhaps more uh, in the pipeline as well. So yeah, so this is something I how told from a friend because you told me before you work as like an accountant for the government and then when i told my friends this they were like whoa that gives me way more confidence in like your ability to manage an event because this is before toho fest happened so people didn't know what was going to go on mm -hmm. so yeah i just kind of wanted to ask you like what your job is like and then how that's helped you with running all these events Okay, so, uh, and I got permission from my office to, to mention this as well. So, yes, I work as the government accountant for Los Angeles County. And basically what I do there is more like I'm more of like a, like a data cruncher. So what I would do is I would go on to um, like, their, like the systems. I would then pull out data, uh, you know, and basically these massive Excel, Excel spreadsheets. And what I would do is I would consolidate, sort through them, to generate reports and stuff like that for like management for the executives and such so my whole thing is to manage you know and basically what we do is um my office is we are essentially an administration back office so our main thing is handling administration of like all the various different programs as well as you know uh handling like you know you know tracking all the transactions and whatnot so my main skill my main you know skill and job is administration and finance so the joke, so the whole joke of the situation is that, and also right now, I'm also currently doing my master's program for public administration. So the joke is, as Miko, her thing is called the true administrator. True administrator, yeah. So it feels like the more I go down that route, it's like, oh, the more I'm becoming like her. Eh, you know, I'm just going to roll with that at that point. Eh, whatever. But, you know, but yes, but in all seriousness, that helps because, you know, because like one of the main things is that 
uh, you have to have someone to be able to you know do all the contracts, be able to like handling all, like all the emails and handling the finances and be able to track all that. And because that's what I actually do, that's basically you know what I do on the ba on the back end. So yes, yeah, what all the fans, everyone's going to see is the event itself. But there's all the stuff that happens on in the background. You know, like okay, you know, making sure okay these contracts are are, are okay, making sure the venue gets paid, making sure all the towns you know they're paid. All these, all the little details that happens on in the background. There's all this stuff that goes on, and you know, because that's my actual job, it really helps and such. Yeah, yeah. So I hope that lets people know, like, yeah, that why you are so qualified to run these events. Mm-hmm. Then, yeah. Lastly, can you just talk about Miko to end it off. You can talk about literally anything about her. Yeah, I figured that was gonna be that one. So, uh, so the, I guess, you know, where to start with that one is, so um, this help hopefully helps set the record straight for anyone like that. So I started cosplaying Miko back in 2013, and originally it was because, like, I saw um, uh, my friends playing 13.5, and I, I knew who Miko was, and I, her design was okay, her theme is, you know, pretty interesting, but I, at that point I hadn't done that much research into her backstory yet. And then all of a sudden, it's like I see her in 13.5 and she has the cape. And I thought, okay, that looks so cool. I want to cosplay her. So I started putting together the, no, uh, ordering the cosplay and putting together the pieces. And then when you look at her design, there's so much that goes on like that. And then, you know, but it was you know, very well received. And, you know, I started running, you know, the toll gatherings at AX and at Fanime. So a lot of people knew me from there. And then at, and then the more I started doing it, it's more like I started doing more research into her character and her backstory. Like, wow, I'm really liking her more and more at that point. And um, despite with all, even with all the newer characters, she's always been she's been like my top favorite for like basically ten years. So like actually, as of AX, actually, I think I actually would be ten years I've been cosplaying her. So, and um, of course. 10 years later now, it's like, did I ever see myself as like, oh, I'm the one going to be running the event as Miko? No. That's just something I never would have thought about was going to happen. Um, but the more, like, I feel like I'm going down that route, it feels like the more and more I, I kind of become like her just because, you know, I feel like I have her skill set. Um, and also, you probably seem like, you know, um, so I tend to be a very pragmatic person and such. Um, so the concept is like, well, Byakuren, of course, she tends to be the more ideal, idealistic one. Miko tends to be the more pragmatic one. So that's the reason why I kind of slide more towards her. So like, yeah, the, all these ideas, they're cool and stuff like that. Great. But you, as again, as the administrator, how do you practically implement this stuff? Yeah, that, that is something I thought about because, yeah, Byakuren, emotional skyscraper, mm -hmm. Miko, true administrator, it's like, the heart versus the mind, and I always thought that was kind of an interesting, yeah, dichotomy. Yeah, so like, she's more towards like, you know, humans and yokai living in a harmony, whereas Miko is more, you know, on the side of the humans and doing like that, yeah. So it's a really interesting dichotomy that the two, uh, that the two have and such. So, but uh, there's a reason why I tend to slide more towards Miko and such. Um, and of course, does it help that I'm also, of course, right now running the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the event? Sure. And uh, I know you mentioned this in one of your previous videos. You mentioned about, I don't mind telling, I don't mind. so you, you did that video about the uh, Toa characters and their dream selves. Yeah. So let's just say when you mentioned uh, uh, Miko's portion, it's like, ooh, that one hit really close to home with me. That one really did. So... Um, but it's like it, one of those really fun things uh, for Toa Fed is I got to live out that, you know, one of my cosplay dreams as Miko. Like, she won. Because she basically successfully just took over the entire the, the entire thing. And no one in the Byakuren wasn't there to stop me. <laughs> so, okay. Cosplayers up for the challenge next year. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. This has been really great. So yeah, thank you for coming out to meet me. And yeah, thank you for inviting me also, because 
yeah, this has been really interesting. And like, you know, instead of just like having to talk over Discord and seeing, you know, your reaction and stuff like that, like, oh, I get to actually, we get to have this conversation in real time finally. But yeah, but thanks again for um, like, you know, doing this thing. This is absolutely freaking amazing. So, but anyways, I hope to see you around the future then. Yeah, perhaps, right? and just to close it off, so Toa Fest 2024 happens where and when? So Toa Fest 2024 happens uh, April 27th and the 28th, so the last weekend of um, April for 2024. Uh, same location, Torrance Cultural Arts Center. The day zero is uh, uh, 26. Badges are on sale right now for $50. Uh, you can go on our website, toefest.org. You can uh, also, you know, uh, we also have, like I said, we have the Discord. We're close to a thousand members right now. And of course, we also have Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. So you can follow us, you know, and like that. You can subscribe to our you know, newsletter and such. And like, yeah, we are definitely looking forward to seeing it, you know, you know, basically, you know, bigger and better for next year. So thanks again. Yeah, that should do it for the interview. Thank you for watching. Thank you.